Today on uh, Freedom's TV, we have a guest, uh, Stephen Stacey, a lecturer also and peace activist. Peace TV, peace TV contributes to a better understanding of the questions of life, society, and the laws of nature in the coexistence of people. We demonstrate how to help out as a better, healthier, and more peaceful uh, living together as human beings. How could a happier life, prosperity, and creativity be possible? How do we find a spouse for eternity and a happy life? Making the environment, nature, and the world of work livable and enjoyable is another topic, offering insights, deep understanding by connecting with people who are active in these topics. Let us welcome Stephen Stacy to the um to the topic of a uh, christian world view versus the woke or uh, postmodern world view thank you very much stephen welcome can you say something a little bit about yourself hello everyone hi i'm stephen um i've uh lectured at university i lectured on personal development um I'm really interested in how people flourish and develop and achieve their goals. Um, however, when you look out of the window and see what's happening around the world, you can see uh, many universities are teaching almost the exact opposite of what I was teaching. And I, I had to get involved in sociological affairs, which I didn't really want to get involved in. And I had to try and work out what was, what was happening to our society. Um, there seemed to be a growing malaise, growing pessimism, growing conflict, uh, misunderstandings. Um, so I tried to understand what was happening before, what was happening before the conflict started. And, and once I understood that, I tried to understand how this is being taken, to, taken apart, therefore creating a, a cultural war, which we see in America, uh, east, between East and West Europe and uh, many other places in the world. And uh, I think many people are concerned. They, they don't understand what's, what's happening very well. They, they get some feelings that something's going wrong. They can see their taxes rise. Um, and anyway, so I, today we're going to be talking about uh, the first half of the interview. We're gonna be looking at the Christian worldview that built our amazing nations. And then uh, we'll be moving on. Once we have this analytical framework, we'll be looking at, at how it's being taken to pieces and therefore ending up with some people believing in what, what used to be and some people believing in what, what is today. So that's kind of like the basis of the interview today. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'm very grateful to Johan uh, to invite me to talk about this incredibly important topic. Thank you very much, Stephen. I'm very curious uh, for your explanations and insights because you have such a, a vast experience in life and also in your studies. So the first question, what I am very interested uh, is to you name the three blessings framework and mention Genesis 1.28 and you uh, selected them in three parts, first, second, and third blessing. What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, trying to understand, trying to get an idea of Christianity as it was lived in practice um, during, you know, from this like 1650s onward, when after the family, after the Protestant Revolution, uh, trying to find out how do you simply explain what it was that people were doing and what were they getting right so that they could lift their nations out of thousands of years of poverty. Um, trying to find that framework was very useful. And it was I found it in a uh, the most useful framework in a book called The Divine Principle written by, by Reverend Moon. Um, and he here's the first chapter. And as part of that first chapter, he explains um, the basic principles by which the universe is created. For him, it's a, it's a very it's a, it's a very short in the book, but it's incredibly profound. And I found it incredibly useful to explain 
how the Christians of old were in general living, uh, therefore gaining uh, energy for their cultures and uh, positive energy. So if I can just share the screen a moment. Yeah, so I, so in, his, in this uh, Principles of Creation, he starts off with this, this idea that, um, of course, that God is, because he's a religious framework, God is the subject of the universe, and God has an essential character. He has just an embedded character. that, And, and when he creates um, with the universe, with the energy of the universe, he, he manifests his character into the creation. And there's harmony between who he is and how the creation manifests itself, yeah, which is basic Christian idea. Um, and then, but then he adds another layer. He says also, because the universe is uh, based upon the dual characteristics of masculinity and femininity or positivity or negativity, um, he he senses that that duality must exist within God. Uh, he senses that there must be a masculine element of God and a feminine en element of God, and they somehow interact uh, harmoniously. And when they manifest themselves into the world, that we see this duality in, in the flowers and and in humans and in all species of animals. Uh, and therefore, what is the the duality of God is manifest into the physical world. And this is really interesting when you think about that, that whole process. And from that basis, he develops a picture of how humans will flourish in the world. And, and, he, and he, he takes this framework from the first chapter of the Bible. He says in Genesis 20, 1, 28, God gave humans three primary ways to receive blessings. Um, the first is, and the, the the Bible verse is be, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. And so he basically interprets this in a certain way. He says the three ways humans gain, gain blessing. And the first way is to become a fruitful individual. So we'll talk later about what that means, but basically become a person who can uh, offer something useful to society. And he says, Multiply means to, to marry and to bring children into the world. And if we do this, if we bring our creativity and love into marriage and we raise good children, then we feel we are blessed. We feel we're doing something good for the world when we see our kids uh, improving the world around us. And we feel at home with, you know, with our couple relationship and with our children. And this is very important to most of us. And lastly, he says the take dominion means basically we have to thrive economically if we could thrive economically of course blessings will come but this is a very basic paradigm but it's very profound because this is how we live our life like this is you know i'm trying to be a better person i'm trying to build my good family and i'm trying to look after my family's their economic needs and if i do those things i feel like i'm i'm being blessed and my life is going well yeah so okay so it so this is how he does it, it it's a very wonderful picture he creates he he gets this diagram where there's god he has this mind and body unity which we saw in the first part we become that temple of god so this is a christian idea that you're children of god or a temple of god or a disciple of jesus following his pathway and and we our mind takes on god's character in some form and then we use our body to build a fruitful world to to create a, a good world and by doing that, through that interaction, we become fruitful. But basically, he, the, the idea is we represent God on earth and we're trying to do something good in the world. And uh, if we do this, blessings will come. And then he uses the next, the, the next diagram, the second blessing diagram. He takes the dual characteristics of masculinity and femininity. And he says, well, they, they become manifest in the world. God becomes manifest in the world through a husband and wife, you might say, through the interact, their loving interaction. And when they have a child, the child will look at the, the father and mother and think, this is the biggest picture of God's love I'm going to get. I got, it's not going to get any better than this. And, um, and, and, I, and I grow through that masculine love, my feminine love, and I grow and I nurture myself. And, and so this is the best picture a child can have of God, what God looks like, you might say. 
And it's very interesting. So that's my job as a husband to a father to represent that masculine element of God. And my wife is to represent the feminine. And if we do that, blessings will come. That's the theory. And the third blessing, this idea, um, again, God takes the universal, the energy of the universe or the universal prime energy. And he he manifests the creation out of it. And we do the same. We we take the creation and we manifest things. And this allows us to feed our family. And if we do that, we are we feel we are blessed. Of course, if we're hungry or we don't have a home, we don't <laughs> we don't feel we're blessed. But this diagram is very fascinating because because it gives us a, a tool to start to analyze um, how we interact in the world and how we get the best out of ourselves. Yeah? And so it's a fascinating. So you get this three three blessing framework. This mind and body, me achieving my goals based upon my my dreams and uh, developing my intellect or thoughts and me and my wife building some loving family and me trying to feed my family and and uh, build a home and when you think about it actually if i'm trying to be the best i can be if i'm trying to build a loving family and if i'm trying to feed my family in an ethical way and and uh, not hurting society and others through it there's actually no better way to build a flourishing society if we are all doing that can't have a bit of better political framework than, than that so it's a very interesting picture he creates and it's very profound because it gives us a clear idea of what it takes to build a flourishing society. And, and that's very important to us. Yeah, it's just, it's just in a few pages, but it's, it's when you think about it, it's very profound. Yeah, very interesting. Um, usually you hear this uh, Bible verse in a very short sentence, very vast. And but you show the deeper meaning uh, in this short sentence and. Uh, to really also as a, like a, a guidance or purpose of life included in these three steps of uh, blessings. And um, this is really a deep concept which needs to really be reflected and, and meditated about. And um, what is interesting that you also mentioned that existent actions and multiplication is uh, also uh, quite deeply explained, and you you have some insights about that. Yes, um, just before he explains the three blessings framework, he explains like some of the principles that that come out of that framework, and one of the sections he calls is give and take action. Yeah, so basically. If we again go back to the to the slide, basically he says, um, because God is a, always a God of duality, then everything in the universe we see is based upon the interaction between two two things. Yeah, uh, whether it's be my mind and body, or me and my friends, or or masculine and feminine, or whatever. There's all to create the energy for something to happen. There has to be a give. It, there has to be a he called a subject object dynamic and when that happens according to the plan of god then three forces are created and he calls these the forces that well it's the translation of the korean is uh, existence action and multiplication now you could interpret that in lots of different ways you can um, talk about the existence like an atom you have a existence of the atom when when the subject and object give and take action and you bring about the existence of the atom and then the atom has certain properties so copper atom has different properties than uh, helium atom. and 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 it will act differently because of that and the third thing is because of those different properties it will interact with other atoms in different way so there's always in everything every thing in the universe it has this be being it has this internal qualities uh, and then it has the way it interacts with the world and, it's, and 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 everything has that and when it comes upon the will of god then the universe flourishes we get this wonderful flowers and trees and a humor interaction and and so if i'm uh, doing something good in the for somebody, then they might do something good for somebody else. Or if I love my children, they will grow up and do hopefully good for the world. 
And so there's this always this uh, three dimensions and everything. So when you think about the three blessings that we talked about earlier, because it's centered upon God, when I'm becoming fruitful human being, then when I become fruitful, then this leads to the continued existence of my culture. It, it's just, I, I'm trying to sustain the good in my culture. And I'm also trying to offer the foundation for development. So hopefully I will grow over my lifetime and become better than I was. And therefore, I would do something better with my life. So this being fruitful, we can call it the social purpose of the first blessing. It is this point where what I do benefits me, but it also benefits society. If I'm trying to be a fruitful person, then I hopefully am enjoying my life and enjoying the, the things I do and uh, the learning I'm going through. But also my society is benefiting at the same time. And, and it's very important to, to, there's a social purpose to the first blessing. We'll talk about why that's important later. And also the second thing is this husband and wife. They're the marriage, because it's centered upon God, it's the manifestation of God's duality on earth. It allows for the continued existence of communities. Uh, it usually sustains the good. So almost all cultures in the world have marriage cultures because they found out you can't survive without them. And it also offers the future development. So it offers the chance for, and that's what happened over the last 300 years when, when the families kept the marriage going and uh, the development of the Europe happened. Compared with the second blessing, social purpose is this to protect and nurture your biological children. So this is the point again where I benefit because I have nice children and they, <laughs> and they love me and I love them. Uh, but at the same time, society benefits. Yeah. And uh, of course, I could use misuse my children for my own need and they might get hurt, um, but then they they don't hurt society, help society, etc. And then, and then the, sec the last thing is the same thing with this third blessing, where we use creation uh, to create things to to serve people to food and to make things for them. And, and when we interact with the creation in the right way, we our society continues to exist we can sustain the good in our society there's money flowing and and this is and we can this basis creates the foundation for future good so again if i aim to feed my family that's my job um and i do it ethically upon god's will then this is again where the society benefits and i benefit at the same time okay so it's it's all these things flow together and um of course, you can do something that's not centered upon God's will. You can do something ungodly, you know, unfruitful, and it does the opposite. It has the opposite effect. If I go, if I go stealing, the theft exists in reality. Um, the action it harms someone's life, and and the last thing it um, it creates a ripple effect around society. People start putting fire alarms on their houses, or they worry about the safety of their cars, or and so there's always a ripple effect for positive acts, <laughs> and there's always a ripple effect for negative acts. And that's really important to understand because often we think we can act without any, all our acts are like individual and no one's going to get affected, but it's just not the way the universe works. I'm very sorry. Um, if I do something wrong, my conscience will get to me. I, I get ang I start to get angrier because I'm, you know what I mean? And then I take it on my wife and et cetera. It never stays just with me. So you could, all behaviors have social consequences and they can create generative energy or degenerative social energy. And uh, it's very interesting that this section is very short, but it explains these three forces and that's useful. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. This uh, um, sounds uh, too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, but inside, I think uh, many people feel anyway, give and take is better than uh, conflict. You showed clearly development comes only by give and take and by uh, giving a benefit uh, to society and to, uh, you yourself have a big uh, benefit on on each level, like personal, family and, and in in a bigger world view, if you take care of nature and creation or do a good job, contribute to society. And um, 
also what uh, wonders me is what are the inner workings of the three blessings? Yeah, as I said, in, in the section on um, give and take action, it says there's uh, existence, action, and multiplication. And action is identity. So when you think about uh, the existence of a tree, uh, but the identity of a tree has got roots, it's got branches, um, it's got leaves, it might give fruit, you can might use the wood for something, et cetera, et cetera. So we say the word, and it has an identity that that um, that can be multiplied. We can then use the tree for lots of things, and birds use it, and et cetera, et cetera. So, it, so of course, there's, when you talk about a fruitful individual, that fruitful individual has an identity or some kind of internal workings that that make the fruitful person um, fruitful. <laughs> and it's good to know what that is because we're kind of unclear today what a fruitful person is. So. Some people just believe that they can um, support some political ideas and that they think are good and they, they're good people. But, but Christ's story is, um, is very different than that. You, you have to be. <laughs> it's you who have to be a fruitful human being. So we can talk about the inner workings of each of the three blessings. So what does it mean to be a temple of God? You can look at the Bible. You can look at Jesus's words. You can look at his behavior. And there's some basic things, like, for example, the core values, like we got the Ten Commandments. They are all community protecting values. You don't want to upset your neighbor by by having infidelity or stealing from them or murdering their child. It doesn't create community peace. Spreading false rumors about people doesn't doesn't, <laughs> doesn't bring joy and unity and honoring your father and mother, learning to value the good that is in the community, it's uh, it's important, not just complaining all the time. So what else is in fruitfulness? Uh, you continually develop yourself. You might get mentor, coaching, training, education. And of course, we become more competent, hopefully, as we do so. And um, then we individually might um, develop our ability to work with other people, to be more conscientious and thoughtful about our actions. We might learn to be more playful or humorous or creative. Uh, take up a hobby you know we might develop ability to help other people grow we might take up be a coach or mentor for some people or and we all have to get better at protecting ourselves and others maybe to learn to sign contracts better or saying no to behaviors that hurt us or these kind of things and as we do so we we become better at living in this world yeah we also need to learn how really how relationships work that would help us <laughs> and uh, to learn to give something to people of joy, happiness, smile, something useful, appreciate other people more instead of just looking at their bad points. Um, we might have to learn instead of complaining um, to learn to see difficulties as a chance for growth. Oh, why does this happen? Uh, why is my computer not working? Instead of kicking it, we, we do a computer course. Or <laughs> and we all have to learn more about forgiveness because people make mistakes all the time. And if we're just walking around resentful and angry, we're not, we're not going to be happy human beings. We let it go, uh, pass it over. And lastly, we can talk about um, healing wounds. Like we've all been traumatized probably uh, by somebody, parent, grandparent, uh, somebody we trusted. And we're a bit angry about that or comes out wrong. And how do we heal those wounds so that we can represent more of God's love is a very important aspect. And of course, a lot of people get reborn through Jesus. They feel like something, some love pouring out, like something's healed in them. And many people like change their lives, move away from some destructive behavior because of that. So these kind of things make us more fruitful. We have this... Uh, Second blessing, yeah? And it has internal content. If if the job is to protect children, nurture children, then we have to act in ways that actually do protect children so that God can come down into their lives and, and give them a bright future. The refrain from premarital sex is important because it, 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 it just, without that, we lead to too many children who are not, you know, the parents don't want to connect, too much single parenting. It, 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 we, we'll talk more about that later. Um, so therefore, we need a marital promise. That it's not just to each other. It, it's to the child. It's, a to, it's to the future child. It's to say, we will be, if we create you, we're going to take responsibility to, to love you and to nurture you. Yeah. 
Of course, infidelity is hurt, hurtful to the family system and to children. And we hope that when we hit a problem in marriage, uh, we will realize that we need to grow, that we haven't learned to manifest God's love enough. Um, we haven't maybe healed. We haven't learned right core values, right relationship skills. Um, therefore, we hopefully, this is just telling us, go out and learn something and we will grow from it. And um, of course, we we hope that we have affection, <laughs> love and appreciation in our marriage. And this package of norms has the term absolute monogamy. It was termed by a writer, J.D. Unwin, back in 1932 in a book called Sex and Culture. And he found that cultures that could practice absolute monogamy could flourish. Very, very important to understand that. So that's what our ancestors from 1650 onwards, this is the norm that most people lived. People understood that they were real dangerous to, to this the premarital sex, and uh, it was kept within this box. Uh, in general, you look at 1930 movies that they just people are just very careful, and it's not just our cult cultures all over the world understand this. And then the, the inner workings of the third blessing, the thriving economy. So here's some examples: we get to keep most of the money we we create with our talents. We we're, we're trying to learn to manifest our uniqueness, and we're encouraged to do that. Various parables that Jesus talks about and uh, he, he expresses the desire to develop your talents. God does not happy if you're not developing yourself to your best uh, and you have a right to keep that and it's a, it's a, it's a pro process of it, seeing that if I do that I will keep it. You want a protected legal system so that you don't keep getting uh, eaten up by, by, by bad people. Or So we had a very good law in England for protecting people, contracts, we need a, the right environment, like roads and you know, plumbing and ships and all kinds of things. So the logistical environment, so I can help feed my family. And, and we've got to take care of the creation for future generations. And, and we did that in some ways in the past. We, got, we were bad at some things and we're trying to get better. So we are very aware of that process. So basically, these, all these three blessings have things that make them what they are. And, uh, and allow God to manifest in society. And what we find is that if a culture, if people choose or a culture chooses to do any of the internal workings better than their predecessors, then their culture develops, okay? So if you develop your education system, if you help people develop their relationship skills, if you help them develop their core values, if you develop the economic framework or build infrastructure, or if you have better marriages, et cetera, that will help the next generation have better outcomes. And of course, it's the same the other way around. It's if you take away those internal workings, uh, if you have poorer core values, poorer marriages, et cetera, we, we, we decay, we have social decline. And uh, that's how, that's very simple, how, <laughs> how cultures develop and don't develop. And so we have a choice as human beings, am I gonna live these internal workings out Am I going to grow? Am I going to love my wife and children? Um, or, or am I going to steal or what? And we have a choice as human beings. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Johan? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think uh, your, your presentation would be good for a SWOT analyze, analyzing our society. For example, if, if something goes or not uh, in the way what, uh, what people perhaps intend, they could look in areas like you presented in the individual family and in the uh, relationship with work and creation, nature, what went wrong. Mm. <laughs> uh, some uh, develop some program of uh, analyzing uh, the society, uh, not just giving a vision. You give a vision. Uh, you do you feel, Johan, do you feel like you've developed then over the years? Do you feel like any of those internal qualities? Have you worked on? Do you think you? Absolutely, because uh, I, I mean, of course, uh, uh, the best my wife would be able to say. <laughs> <laughs> because self glorification is maybe not the best. But uh -huh. uh, anyway, um, I think it's the wife and children and family sometimes I'm like a mirror, and even other people can mirror back certain things. And for me, it is um, it is like this that uh, 
Uh, of course, there's many areas what need to be improved. This, this is very sure. But uh, on the other side, uh, can see that there is um, there is uh, it makes sense in, in, uh, to invest and to 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 really try to improve and even not only individually like you said also improve as a couple as a family also to improve in our social relationships uh, so i think this absolutely makes sense also by experience i can testify yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. and you you also uh, talked or uh, you showed the last slide already about the love and beauty dynamic because this is a field which in society almost everybody interests in music in literature in films uh, love and beauty basically but sometimes in a way which is not very constructive and not very uh, how to say helpful so i'm curious what you say about this topic <laughs> yeah the the, the physical creation, it, he, as he builds up towards this three blessings paradigm, he's explaining some of the sub principles of the three blessings. And one of the one of the ones he really is real, I think, is so important to us all to understand is, and it came out embedded within the Christian framework, is this is, a, is something he calls the love and beauty dynamic. And basically, he says God has power; he has power to create the whole universe. Yeah. So what? why would God get out of bed in the morning? Why would he create the universe? What's his purpose? What's his goal? And he says the only reason why God might get out of bed is because he wants to find meaning or something beautiful. He, he, he wants to, to enjoy something else. Yeah. Um, so it's this, this idea that by, by the desire for finding beauty, triggers us to want to give you might say oh i really think taking up sailing would be enjoyable so you see something beautiful there and you you it triggers you to buy a boat and <laughs> take a course of you know building to being creative and positive way um he he's he's stimulated by that he, he said, wow look at that family he's in, i didn't know uh, peanut butter and jam went together so well you know? <laughs> and he he gets inspired by the unique creativity of human beings and by by feeling and senses that yeah so it is this search for 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 beauty that triggers him to want to give of himself and it is and what is beauty beauty defines itself in all kinds of different ways so like Human beings themselves, we read lots of books, for example, philosophical books. We're trying to understand truth because truth is beauty. is another one form of beauty. Or we like beauty itself. We might go out into creation or an art gallery or something, and that triggers us to go out. Or um, goodness. Goodness is another form of beauty. We go, wow, this is so lovely. Are they crying tears? And it's a nice movie. Uh, and meaning, finding something meaningful to do with our life, it being useful, that triggers us. Oh, I want to go and serve society in some way or invent a new thing called apple computers or <laughs> uh, and I, that will be meaningful to me and i want to make it look beautiful and 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 or joy joy the joy itself is is a beautiful thing just enjoying people and and, and laughing and playing and things like that so all these things are different forms of beauty and they and our search for those things triggers triggers us to to want to get out so in this in this beauty love and beauty section, it 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 this it it mentions that it's only possible. This is this dynamic of motivating ourselves and getting out and growing and develop can only happen if we're appreciative. If I don't appreciate, you know, I can I can walk into somewhere which is other people going wow and this is amazing and something like this, and and I can just go oh I don't see anything useful here, and 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 people who are depressed who find themselves hard to motivate themselves find it hard to find the beauty they, they're not triggered they don't go wow that's exciting i'm going to do that and uh, they go i can't see anything beautiful to trigger me and this is really a problem yeah so so we because we're god's children 
we do exactly the same as God does. When God creates, he uses the love and beauty dynamic. And we do that when we're trying to develop ourselves. Yeah. We find things that we enjoy. We find beauty in. And then we say, oh, that, you know, I, I want to learn about that. I want to I want to help these people. I want to I want to you know, play football. I want to all this drags us out and we, we give up ourselves and, and, and we get beauty back in some form or other, hopefully. And it's the same in a marriage. The second blessing, we get the same dynamic. I find something beautiful in marriage, uh, my children, my wife, and, and that triggers me to, to want to say, here, darling, here's a bunch of flowers. And I'm cooking your meal and get stimulated by, by this love. And it's the same when we, in the third blessing, where we, we're trying to, oh, I'm going to uh, build a nice restaurant, which people find beautiful. And uh, I'm going to serve them and love them with the best I can. And I see beauty in different forms like money and good reviews and making them smile and things like that. And I feel, oh, I, I'm doing something useful for society. Because God, this is essential motivator for God. This is the essential motivation for human beings. And this is how we work. It, it, it's a very precious process. I mean, if we didn't have it, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. But it comes because we're children of God. And it's a very precious realization that that's the point of it. Yeah. So, okay, so something like this. So this this principle of the principle is like it's like really key for me because I realize if I don't develop my level of appreciation, then I won't enter into life as much as I should do. I spent a lot of time working on my appreciation for my wife and children and other people. I'm still not very good at it sometimes, but it absolutely made a difference, transcendent difference to my life and my wife and my children. And and I I, I now have a Rolodex in my brain of all the good things I can think about my wife. And whenever I don't see anything good, I just go, there's something there. <laughs> and that triggers me to say, I'm going to make you a nice meal. And it, it's such a beautiful idea that you can you can self-motivate yourself to out of by finding beauty and other by finding beauty it's really a wonderful wonderful gift we've been given this uh, is very interesting to hear this kind of personal insights also because uh to to see some slides but to see then the practical application and the experience is for me always very precious this kind of uh, law of life, spiritual law, yes. is uh, is already a, a, a real wonderful thing. What can be applied in in so many different situations? Um, you mentioned also in in your writings what I see social development through lineage improvement. What do you mean by that? This would be a really can you give more uh, deeper explanation about that? This is uh, the idea that how does society actually develop? So uh, we talked about the inner workings of the three blessings. So when people themselves become more fruitful or when marriages become better or when people become more skilled and, and society's laws help economic development. So these inner workings. Yeah? So but, the, the, but underneath all that is the idea of social development through family tree or lineage improvement, okay? So we have this evolutionary idea. Any species depends on whether the offspring are a small evolutionary improvement on the previous generation. So the hope of the puffins, they, they can catch a little bit more fish or fly a bit faster or it, as they adapt to the environment, if, if it becomes colder or warmer, they are better equipped. So each generation is better equipped to, to survive and we have this small in evolutionary improvements, yeah? So it's the same with human societies, yeah? We have this idea that if the children at the age of young adulthood are a little bit of an improvement on the previous generation of children, then society can move forward. So if the children have improved intellects or improved core values or relationship skills and can build better marriages or whatever, then society can go forward because it takes it takes generations to build a culture it's not done in one generation and so cultures that that refine the art of lineage improvement they've managed to bring about the processes 
which will make sure that the next generation children on average are better than the last. Okay, so there's this concept of how one treats the child, so will be the future of your nation. If you treat them badly, your nation will go downhill. If you, if you, if you can treat them with respect and help them grow and develop, then your future is assured. Okay, it's not about primarily governments changing the world. It's about how we all work together to help that child so that it can have better improvement. So you can ask yourselves, if we, if we manage, allow children to have pornography in today's world, is this going to help them or not? And, you, <laughs> and honestly, uh, we've lost the plot. Yeah, we, we've forgotten this concept of working together so that the children can have a better outcome because a lot of children are getting hurt now. Yeah? So we should all be interested in that we, because of what we all want to improve society. Everybody should be interested in how the child is having better outcomes. Can charities help? Can the business world help? Can, can extended family help? Can politics help? Can education, faith community, media? We all should be somehow helping this development. And we can see if you run through that list that some parts of society have forgotten, <laughs> totally forgotten this process, which we once understood because it must have happened in England from the 1650s onward because that's why a society developed. Okay. So you can improve anywhere, sense of ownership. But today we have a lot of victimhood culture, feeling people feeling emotional well being. A lot of people are struggling with issues. Core values are definitely struggling. More people are not so grateful anymore. They're, now we live in amazing societies, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? And refrain from out of wedlock sex. Well, that's gone out the window, et cetera. <laughs> We're meant to be improving these things with the children, and then our society will improve. And right now, we're, we're, to be honest, we're going the opposite way, and that, that's kind of a problem. And so you can hurt lineage. And so we have, on the, we have a situation where in society you have... Um, Quite a few children are still going through that process of lineage improvement. You can see them developing, like especially immigrant children, many immigrant children, like the Indian children, you know, they come and they, they were bus drivers back in their own country, and their children are now doctors and <laughs> lawyers. But on the edge of society, there's this growing group of kids who are experiencing lineage de decline, lineage decline. And this group is growing bigger by the year. Um, and uh, it wasn't the same in the 1960s when the vast majority of children did better than their parents. Um, now we're seeing the opposite happening. Yeah. So, you know, what's the core of this decline? Because you know, there's lots of reasons why you can say media, you can say all these different things. But, but fundamentally, the principle is clear that children are most likely to see God and be most nurtured and protected if they are raised by their two biological parents. So therefore, the marital norm of the 1650s is important because that created the foundation for lineage improvement to occur. And if you don't have that, then God, God can't come down into the children's lives. They, can't, they, they don't feel they have life, many of them. Uh, they get depressed and things like that. When the family collapses, when it fractures, we find two things are more likely to happen. A lot of children get an attachment trauma, what we call an attachment trauma. And they really question because often they're one of the parents they might never see again or see rarely. It's really important to the child to know that both parents love them and they question that love. And they can be that out of that, am I lovable? Maybe I caused the divorce. It can lead to like things like depression or addiction or things like that, which harms the child's ability to actually also live a three blessings lifestyle and the joy that that creates. But also children in a fractured family face a multitude of increased risks. They might be more likely to be physically abused, sexually abused. They might be demotivated from studies. Uh, they might have less disciplining or behavioral issues, uh, et cetera. And so when children don't get, don't get that picture of God's love and that daily love's love through, through their parents, then things start to, they start to be separated from God's life energy, you might say, and, and start to have, not always, of course, many, many single parents have done an amazing job that they, even if they separate, they look after their kids uh, very well and do an honorable work, but it's just more likely that this isn't going to happen and the child is more likely to have experience of worse life outcomes because of that. So we can see this um, as society since the 1960s, uh, the two parents 
family has reduced substantially and the one parent family has gone up. There's this uh, J.D. Unwin, when he studied uh, in his, he wrote a book, Second Culture in the 1930s. Um, he said cultures developed over generations. Yeah, Even within three, when they got the absolute norm of absolute monogamy together, when they took care of their kids and properly and they developed lineage improvement processes, then they could develop literature and plays. And we got all these Greek plays and philosophers and all these people coming out of this era because they had a lineage improvement happening. But they all decayed the same way. Um, uh, they had a rise in premarital sex and, and that led to the breakdown of the family uh, and the concept of lineage improvement. And that's what we're doing today. Because of this, we can see here in the family breakdown happened, started happening in 1965 or so. And we can see when the children are hitting adulthood in 1980s, then we can see the prison population starting to just go up. Yeah, these are the start of the children who who got hurt in that process. And it's a massive increase from some half a million to over three million in just a few years. We get just in the last 20 years, stress, deaths by drug overdoses, meaninglessness and feeling of hopelessness. And um, even in England, self-harm has doubled in the last what, 20 years or so, kind of a, a worrying picture. And all this is incredibly expensive. It's expensive to have kids in jail and, and harming themselves, social workers, and and it gets very expensive. In New Zealand, they found that one struggling child can cost a million pounds by the age of 18. And New Zealand found that like 10% of struggling kids who they identified when they were four um, will consume over 50% of the welfare budget when they get adulthood. It's, um, and uh, fractured families in England, at least a 50 billion a year. Um, and that over 40 years gives us a, a whole national debt. And there we go. And that's where it comes. So here again, we got the same thing. It's very low national debt, 1960s. It's happily going along. And then along come 1980s, when we start to see the consequences of the breakdown of the family and uh, off it goes. It, it just God can't come down into the child's life in this situation. And they and the life energy leaves us leaves a culture. I hope that makes sense, this concept of lineage uh, improvement and, and where it comes from and how we can also lose it if we lose focus. And do you feel we've lost focus, Johan? No, 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 no. It is, uh, I think uh, you you <clears throat> showed uh, clearly that uh, this um, social development through lineage, how, how this uh, could be observed uh, very, very almost <laughs> Uh, how to say directly in our society? What hmm. happens if we don't do that? Hmm. In what ways in Austria do you think that that it's kind of like that you're forgetting well, this? We are approaching the bright months. Uh, the whole of June is declared as the bright month. Mm -hmm. In Vienna, there will be a big, big uh, event. Yeah, and um, well, um, people are wondering why the government uh, spent so much money on this kind of events. And, uh, of course, they can always can say families get anyway all kind of things supported. But mm -hmm. I mean, but uh, compared the public attention to healthy families is not the same way. It's always mentioned in problem situations. Right, so do we, do we have uh, 11 months of... Uh... Pro marriage months. <laughs> yes, really, I Do must we... say. And you know? my experience is families need some kind of uh, help in arguments why they live the way they want to also testify right. about their happiness. I think uh, many people are very unhappy. They are still promoting values which makes them even more unhappy. So uh, I think this kind of uh, Lineage improvement is a, a big topic in a way of not uh, being uh, egoistic, uh, because this is many times people are being uh, accused of. You are egoistic as parents. You want your children always be with you, and you don't allow them to stay overnight with strange families. Uh, for example, when they were, our children were small, we we were very protective yeah. and and um and at the same time we have good experience in that because many times we found out 
something happened to them. Uh, so other children through some situation and they got really, a, 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 how to say, a harm for their life. Mm. Mm. So um, you also mentioned that um, in this way, our relationships, we can learn from the animals. I mean, I must say, uh, this is uh, from which animals? I would like to know <laughs> from you because on Twitter, I had a confrontation with somebody who who said the chimpanzee make love with anybody anytime and have not so much a sense of family, basically. Which, which animals do you want to suggest we should copy? <laughs> So we covered the, the core of Christian worldview, you might say. We've, we, we're motivated by love and beauty. We've got a free blessing framework we can live out. Um, our actions, some of our actions can be uh, very positive in the world, and we, uh, but some of them can be negative, and we have to be aware of that. Um, how, our, how our societies grow. Um, these are the core of the Christian worldview, and it's really helpful to know these things. Yeah, But the trouble is conveying it. The society we 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 don't know, we don't know how to convey that to society in a simple way. Um, it's taken me what one hour <laughs> to talk about it, and it's not so easy. And there's a lot of contradictions for some people. They argue with certain things. So I'm trying to thought of what how can I do this in a very simple way? How can we we talk about these topics so that people within a few minutes they can start to understand the the situation and the problems involved. I thought about the species of animals. I said, you can't get any more basic than looking at animal species and how they interact and grow. This is a very natural process. And lots of people talk about getting back to nature these days and eating healthy and we need to save the planet. And how can we be natural human beings? But I thought, well, all species are natural and can they help us? And studied all these different animals. And I found that there's these like 30 species of animal they are pair bond for life and they all live what i would call the say the three blessings lifestyle that's what they do so a young puffin throat gets into the world he's he, he strives to grow up to be a reasonably healthy puffin. he wants to be a fit he wants to learn the norms of the puffins he wants to learn to catch fish and and and, and build a nest and other things and 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 then when he's a fruitful enough some girl will come along and he'll look at the girl and they'll check each other out and then they 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 kind of like if they don't like each other they'll walk away but if they like each other they think they're good enough for each other they will bond uh and they will create a family and they will look after that family nobly look after that family and uh this is the place of puff enjoy and meaning this is what makes a puffin happiest? <laughs> what gives them meaning in life? They don't have to, you know. They for the winter they fly off to the Atlantic, yeah, and they don't have to come back. They don't have to go through the hassle of raising kids. They don't have to do through any of this living with somebody else. The hassles involved. They could just stay out in the Atlantic fishing, <laughs> but they find meaning in flying back, hanging out with their partner, and creating more babies and having joy doing that. So this is very important for them. And we find that all these species do have exactly the same sexual norm. They all have the sexual norm of absolute monogamy. They all express these things that so they don't have premarital sex, unlike a lot of species that just have sex and walk away, for example. They have a marital moment. They, often there's a courtship, like a lot of them do very beautiful courtship dances, like the swans and the bald eagles and, uh, and the albatrosses. They value fidelity. They very rarely have extra partners. They, they very rarely divorce, and they almost all express ongoing affection to keep their relationships. So in other words, they sound like good Mormons or good Catholics. You go, oh, this is very interesting that they do this. They, they express affection in different ways. So the Arctic tern will bring a fish to his beloved, give her gifts. The, the male prairie vole will comfort his beloved when she's stressed out. He'll sit next to her, which human males find really hard to do. The storks will dance together, enjoy, and the gibbons will groom and massage each other. And we recognize these as uh, things we do to keep our relationship strong. And so you start to wonder about them, and then you think, oh, how much of the first blessing you know, that we want to have to embody, you'll find that they don't kill each other. They, they follow the, pretty much follow the Ten Commandments, basically. <laughs> they don't kill each other, unlike lions or a lot of other species that will, will eat each other up violently. They 
won't go around and kill each other. They're just uh, happy to have their home and just leave me alone. Um, they develop their nurturing abilities and to protect themselves, etc. They take personal ownership of life. They educate themselves, etc. You know, oh, this is this is this is a healthy, healthy puffin, healthy human. And in the puffin world, they get they they live a free market lifestyle. There's hopefully not too many sharks or other animals taking their food away from them. They choose a place that supports them economic development and they protect their environment so they can be there for thousands of years. Same rock. Same, and they're so basically you can get start to think, well, the Christian viewpoint and the principal worldview, um, it suggests that we have an optimal species norm that it, and it's the lasting love species norm. It's the same as these species. And it brings about optimal outcomes for citizens and our nations. The Christians talk about the fall of man, like something went wrong and we crumbled and we decayed and we created Sodom and Gomorrah and we did all kinds of things. And we've seen civilizations rise and fall. Um, but fundamentally, the, the suggestion is here that because we're so capable, we can live outside of our species norm. Whereas the puffins can't, yeah? And the lions can't. If they left their species norm and did something different, they would die out. But the suggestion is that human beings can live several species norms and we each of which generates different amounts of energy and we're trying to get back to this one <laughs> and christianity said if we live this species norm then then we we'll be the most flourishing societies and that's what happened for the last 400 years or so and that's why we could drag ourselves out of poverty um and so this is very interesting that, that to, to think about that. So it's a very simple concept. If we live this species norm and the absolute monogamy that goes with it um, and the economic standards, etc., cetera, um, we will flourish. That's it. It's not hard. I did it in, what, five minutes. <laughs> very simple concept. We're true love species, but we have extra need or extra demand. Uh, we we have we we like an extended family network. We have friends. We build communities of support, and but they're all often to do with helping us develop and and helping our family. So we still go back to this core um, of of a three blessings lifestyle. So this is we can call it puffinism plus as a concept that um, we got this three blessings lifestyle. We got absolute monogamy, and but we have a need to. For extra support to help our children and family life and help us grow. Very simple idea. And it provides, a, if, you, if you believe this, if you can catch the value of this, then it provides a rock solid framework that can show us how a healthy society is built. So finally, we can grasp, oh, this is how a healthy society is built. We talked about you know, the three blessings earlier being you know, nothing better than that and absent monogamy. And here we have something which says, yeah, this, this is what it is. This is this is how we do it. We don't have to go rise and fall of nation. If we can just do this consistently, then there's hope for the humanity. We don't have to keep re recreating problems and forgetting that that we're true love animals. So once you understand that this is like an optimal norm, then this provides a wonderful basis to analyze society. You can do it, use it to analyze all kinds of things. You can explain how a healthy society is built. You can show why voluntary restrictions on sexuality is essential. You can analyze history and world politics. You can do all kinds of things with it. And it's a very useful framework, simple to understand. Okay, so we said uh, earlier that uh, nations that embody more of the three blessings norm will flourish. Okay, so Singapore, we can look at Singapore. It, in 1965, it gained its independence. It was still a poor nation. It was but it, it gained a democracy and it stuck hold to the fast of that democracy and fought to make it work. Um, and they sought to develop much of Puffinism plus. So there was a lot of corruption and the prime minister really came down hard on government officials who were corrupt. They cleaned up the whole government as much as possible in the uh, corruption index of the world. It's Singapore's up there with the least. They, they developed their education system. So their children are the brightest in the world on um, PISA. They focused on family development. The government supports family. It spends a lot of money on family protection and support. 
Um, and it uh, made the infrastructure really good, the rule of law clear for everybody and kept a fair. And, and they, they come quite hard down on anybody who wants to do things to hurt other people. They say, yeah, this is just not acceptable. We're not that kind of society here. But most importantly, one of the most important things they didn't do is they didn't go the way of building a welfare state. Because a welfare state is not part of what the true loves do. It's not how true loves work. <laughs> they didn't, you know, well, true loves don't do that. Um, true loves, um, welfare, sharing food around with others is part of like the wolf pack norm. Wolves share their food around. But uh, we're, we're not wolves. We don't have to have packs. To, to, to survive like wolves, we can survive by ourselves because of our nobility and our fruitfulness. And they said, we're not going that way. We're going to work on lineage improvement instead. We're going to go the way of raising up our kids to be the best they can be, and then they will be capable. That's what that's our focus. And instead of having a welfare state, what they did is they, they had low taxes for companies and people, and they forced people to save the money that they would have been taxed. Okay, so if I would have given five thousand taxes to the gov government, you had to save that. The company, whatever it would have given to the government, it has to give to the employee as a saving. So every every employee is basically saving about thirty five percent of their salary, and this they can use for their pension, for their buying a house, for their health needs, and for life challenges. So almost everybody's protected. Everybody's got savings. Everybody's flourishing, and the government is 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 really small because it it doesn't have a welfare state. It doesn't have large offices just moving money around. Yeah. So the general ethos that what it does in Singapore, it basically people think it's your job to become noble. It's your job to become fruitful. It's your job to look after the country and not break the law. It gives a very substantial sense of responsibility, which we I think we've lost in our country it has no national debt unlike england and the rest of europe it, it's got savings in the bank it has a very low crime rate much lower than social the ideal of scandinavia the socialist ideal much lower than that it has yearly growth of seven percent um whereas the uk is one percent this is that soviet era growth level <laughs> that's how messed up we are during the boom years of the 1800s we were probably hitting six or seven percent like singapore then we went down to 4% in the 1950s and 60s, and now we're down to 1%. Um, and if you, other countries are growing at 4% or 5%, in, in 20 years, they're going to be twice the size of us, <laughs> their economy. You know what I mean? It, it, the difference between Soviet Union and America, that was massive by the time it ended. Um, and we're going that way because we, we've forgotten the basic principles. So the state focused on lineage improvement, and it said to itself, if we can help bring about lineage improvement, then there will be fewer people needing our compassion. That's our job. So the job of individuals is to show compassion. If you see somebody struggling, it's your job. That's not our job. If we get in the compassion business, then we'll forget our job to raise up society. So they said they kind of like they said the state is for improvement and the individuals can through charities or so your family systems or whatever can help each other. Oh, this is really clever and and they have a flourishing country which is uh, not affected by the same problems we have in the west you know, in any any shape or form so that's helpful to know one if they stick to the puffin norms puffinism plus you get the benefits yeah that's the point yeah now also you can ask yourself well what's a democracy how a democracy is built why did why did we get a democracy they're quite rare a lot of countries only got it 100 years ago. <laughs> um, England's had its growing level for, for three or 400 years, or America's had it just... Um, but they're hard. Most of history, we don't have democracy. But a democracy is rather like a field of puffin nests yeah? or albatross nests. All albatrosses are equal. <laughs> they all have equal rights. And because, because Christianity has this idea that we're a true love species and therefore we all have equal rights, the laws in the 1930s were based on the belief that we're a true love species. That's how they came out eventually. We got rid of slavery. We got rid of all these things. Yeah, uh, Because we, we intrinsically understood each person has its, his own home, his own responsibility. So you can look at some of those laws 
as you can say, I, like a puffin, have a natural right to pursue my goal to become a fruitful individual. That's my right. You, you know, nobody should, no bureaucrat should stop me being able to grow. I have a natural freedom to enter into a marriage uh, to protect children that, that I create. That nobody should interfere with that. I have a natural duty uh, to start a business or seek work to earn a living. So that's my freedom. I have a right to start a business. I mean, like, like in, under communism, you couldn't do that. Couldn't start your own business very easily. It was hard to, to do much there. I, like a puffin, have the natural freedom to keep most of the money I make with my talent. Um, natural right to connect with my friends, family, a faith community. So we had this idea of uh, religious rights, religious freedoms. And we have a natural right to take care of creation. That's my job. Yeah. And then everybody has, uh, like everybody else, we all have an equal right to life and a right to protect ourselves from attacks, right to be free from slavery, right to be not to be forced to, to pay someone else's debt, which is we're violating right now by putting a big debt on people who are not even poor. <laughs> so we're kind of like we're losing these ideas. Um, and I have an equal right to say what I believe to be true, which again is under threat. You know, people are saying, no, you can't say certain things because we say so. Under this system, children also have natural rights. They have they have the same thing, an equal right to life, uh, a right to be free from slavery, not to be bought and sold, uh, a right, right to not be forced or to pay someone else's debt, and an equal right to say what they believe to be true. So these are just fundamental to puffin right, um, puffinism. But they also, it's really important to understand they have a natural right and a possible to be raised by the two opposite sex individuals who gave them life. That's their natural right. And they also have a natural right to protection from harmful adult desires. So these are two things that, that our children need. And the reason for this is very clear, because if you take away either of those things, then we weaken the ability of the children to live a three blessings lifestyle. And that's not fair on them. Yeah? It's cruel to them in some, in some form or other. And if we, if we allow adults to hurt them or adults to set up systems where the children don't get the love they need, it, 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 it doesn't help us at all. And uh, we weaken. So this is the natural right of the child. Okay? So, but this is helpful to understand that where our rights came from, and we used to understand this, but since the 1960s, basically, we have uh, taken away every one of the child's rights. We've taken away all of them, and therefore they're suffering much more than they should do. So we'll talk about that more later. And we can also analyze history with this. As I said, humans can come be, have become confused about their natural uh, optimal species norm, which is, I believe is puffinism, it seems to be, because we have lived under other species norm, and, and and one of them is like where the upper, we have a king or, who has several wives, polygamy, and then there's lots of people at the bottom who are servants or uh, in the army who are meant to protect the ruling classes, like sheikhs. So when we, so most of history, we live under a form of royal lionism, where you allow, they allow polygamy, or royal wolfism, where monogamy. So England lived under kings and queens and duchesses, and in the serf system, they had to take care of the lands and give the money to the rich families. And, um, they had to go in the army and things like this. It was hard for their families, or often they it couldn't build a family, uh, but the upper classes had it all. So this is a, like a royal wolfism. This is a wolf pack system. Now, it's important to understand the only three species norms we live, like a wolf pack with the alpha wolves at the top and lower beta wolves at the bottom, and puffinism is a rare thing, uh, and royal lionism. And they, but they all have marriage in somewhere in the structure. They all need somewhere. So whether it be the upper classes or the most of society, somebody has to be doing marriage. <laughs> because if it's not, it just falls to pieces completely. So this is what we find. So we have this wolf pack norm, alpha wolves at the top, alpha families. Uh, today's world, we have like oligarchs in China, where you have all these ruling families and they, they're billionaires and everything else. And then people there to work in factories so that they can get wealthy and 
I mean, we went through this in England too, and they keep them in place with aggression and kindness. You know, this is like sometimes we're kind to you, but sometimes we'll beat you up and steal your land from you. And a lot of the beta walls in a wolf pack, a lot of the beaters never get the chance to marry. They're always single, just serving the upper families. And that's what happens in this in royal wolfism. And there's no such thing as equal right in a wolf, such royal wolfism. It's really what the upper walls want to give. You know, here's a bit. We'll give you some bit of food here, you know, a bit of something. So it's a kind of interesting to see the comparison. Of, and uh, we also have this uh, royal lion, lionism where the harem system, the, the male has several wives. That, uh, and we have this is Islam. And Islam has built sustainable nations. Yeah, we can't deny that. And they, they they have some very good qualities in them. Um, but one thing we see is that it's very hard because men can have several wives. There's no such thing as equal rights between men and women. Fundamentally, that's what we see. And uh, so it's in, within the Islamic framework. There's there's not equal rights around divorce or what happens is infidelity or inheritance, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no such thing as equal rights. Um, and again, we have this. Um, this lower, lower, lower lions who, who often don't marry, um, who can be used to feed the families of the wealthy families. Okay, so then, so the question is, how do you get to puffinism? If we were under royal wolfism in England, kings and queens, how do we get to have puffinism? What happened? <laughs> you have to have a society where lineage improvement is happening. That's what you've got to get. Yeah, you've got to have a family where much of the three blessings is in place. There's a marital norm that everybody should follow. Yeah, there's, a, there's an education for, for more and more people. There's a rule of law taking place. There's this, you can keep more of what you earn because before you had to offer most of it to the, to the Lord and now you can keep most of it. So it took hundreds of years to finally get this, we can look after ourselves. We are capable of feeding our own families and you don't have a right to take my food away. You don't have a right to <laughs> send me off to war without asking. You don't have a right to these things. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, it took years uh, for children to get an education. Women get their rights, slavery to end. It took time to build this puffin centered, we're all equal and we all have equal rights. All these Christian nations went through this process, Britain, America, Switzerland, New Zealand, Austria, they all kind of ended up with some kind of democracy where people have equal rights, yeah? And it's uh, the, the framework and the system to keep that going. So we have the concept of an English man is his castle. It's my home. You don't have a right here. Leave me alone. <laughs> what I do in my home is my job. And so when this, as this puffinism took place and as this, as this three blessings norm became integrated into each family and lifestyle, then we can see from like the 1650s is when like the marital norm and we got our democracy, we got, we got rid of the king. And then within 50 years, you can start to see a, a substantial blip in growth. And then it got higher as more, we got more and more freedoms and more and more rights uh, within the puffin framework. We, we started to take off. So each family experienced lineage improvement. People got cleverer. People became more sufficient. They could look after their own homes. We didn't need a Lord telling us what to do. We, we are sovereign citizens. Okay. Um, anyway, and then we gave this thing to, to other countries when, when, when they decolon we got it decolonized. Um, we, um, we taught them a lot of these puffin ways. We taught them the rule of law, the right of the individual, the education system, um, economic laws, etc., so that they could inherit a democracy when they would never have got it. Most of these nations by themselves would never have there, but we gave it to them. And since then, we have seen a massive explosion in wealth and health all across the world over the last 60 years. We have billions of people out of poverty. Um, we can also look at geopolitical issues using puffinism. The wolf pack norm is a pack norm and it's territorial. The lion norm is the same. You, you have territories of lions. Um, and you keep that territory in place through aggression. And you expand your 
you often go and expand your territory through aggression. Um, and basically, the royal families or the classes say, you know, you you beat your citizens, go off and expand my territory so my family can do better. So we have more wealth. But when Puffinism took over our countries, we became more and more peaceful. And so the USA, which is like built its constitution on Puffinism um, of equal rights, never built an empire. It didn't go it didn't go off and conquer. It could have conquered most, pretty much most of the world, but it didn't. Because well, well, what's the mentality of the Puffin mentality is I'm happy in my own home, looking after my kids, having my friends, my family, and I want other Puffins in other countries to do the same. Yeah. And I'm willing to defend your right, your right to try and achieve that. So they spent billions and trillions protecting the democracies of other nations and trying to support them. And so this is a very different mentality than being pushed around by some upper oligarchs who send you off to war. And then we set up the United Nations because we said that we, we can do we can talk peacefully, we can solve problems, we don't need war. So this is Papini. This is it's the most peaceful of all the species norms. And um, of course, many nations were negatively affected by they didn't flourish as much as they should do. A lot of them had corruption and therefore they couldn't flourish, they couldn't live out the fruitfulness. Um, Marxism, they taught them economic wolfism and they, they struggled, they couldn't develop. And, um, and the ones who have lionism, which is because Puffin is built on monogamy, not on not because equal rights that comes from this Puffinism. Um, they most unstable ones seem to be those nations with uh, democracies with, with polygamy, because there's not equal right. You know. So we have this situation. Uh, you can analyze what happened to Russia. Russia was uh, had the Tsar. He it could have it, it in 1917, like Germany, it could have gone the way of Germany and become a democracy. It didn't. It got taken over. So it was it was the Russians were under. Um, royal wolfism, the Tsar, and they but they could have moved to Puffinism like Germany, okay, um, but it didn't. It got infect, infected by Marxism, and Marxism says we should share the food around. That's it. So it, the structure of society just moved from royal wolfism to Marxist wolfism, where you have the top people telling everybody down the bottom what to do, making it impossible to build the economic resources of their own family. They didn't concentrate on lots of things which needed to, for democracy to thrive, um, free speech. So it moved from royal wolfism to Marxist wolfism. And when Marxism collapsed, because it's useless, um, uh, because it were, not, we're not wolves, we're puffins, um, it moved to oligarchy wolfism. Yeah, so we have Oleg Putin and his oligarchs taking so much money from the state. And it's more aggressive. It's just more aggressive. Why can't you just discuss this with Ukraine and try to work out how to solve this problem of a lot of Russians living in Ukraine? And so that, like we do in Scotland, let's give you a referendum. That's a go a puffing way. And then we have these other problems on Earth. Like there's a lot of tension between the Islam and Christian nature, or Islam and Hinduism, which are it's this monogamy versus polygamy. And because they give right give birth to different rights, both of them. Um, they're going to be struggled, and that's it. And you can't solve. And we—it's a real problem we're setting ourselves up for in England because we're inviting in a lot of people from with, who have Islamic background, and we see growing tension in many communities um, based because it's a different set of values, and it, it there's no solving that problem unless everybody becomes puffins fundamentally. Yeah, hopefully um, that gives you an understanding of a framework which can like a give intellectual framework. Um, why I should live a three blessed lifestyle, yeah? Why should I, um, how does it benefit me and society at one and the same time? Um, and this is this, but this is what Christians, many Christians have been doing and many good people, many, many, many people who don't believe have inherited today, they don't believe, but they still do this. Rao, they develop, they set up a family and they are honorable people in their work. And they, this works for them. Why? Because it works. So they use it because it works. But they inherited it because of the previous ancestors who lived, who built this. And if they hadn't had this Christian foundation, they wouldn't be doing this now. Yeah. 
if they still lived under royal wolfism, like a lot of the world countries of the world, they wouldn't be doing this. Or if they lived under Marxism, they wouldn't be doing this. Yeah? And they couldn't be doing this. So this Christian foundation is still powerful, but we're losing it. Yeah? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Are, are you a puffin? Are you a beaver? A true oh, love beaver? Well, are you a true you love know, albatross? What, what are you? Before I didn't know what is a puffin, but now I know uh, <laughs> about the, the, uh, yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, once I understood, sorry, Johan, once I understood I'm basically a puffin, okay. you know, with extras, well, my life became so much clearer. Everything became, oh, that's what I do. Huh? I can't not know now that I have to be responsible or not know that I have to build a good family or not know that I have to look after my economy. This is my job because because this is this is what puffins do, you know, mm -hmm. and that's my job. And mm -hmm. it life became so much simpler once I caught this picture of, of who I am and what brings me most happiness and joy in my life, you know. And I think you have a similar picture, yeah. Do you have a similar picture to the? Yes, to this? Uh, I think the the help what you explain is to this analogy to the animal world and to the animals where we as human beings can can learn something because if somebody observes that and, and find out for himself, he will come to the same conclusions that you just presented. And uh, also if somebody can learn about the, what is a wolf's pack, what is a lionism, I think um, people can understand also the current situation better and also can see what is what be the way out of that no? mm. and uh, yeah. i think uh, that's why it is very helpful to to discuss that and to present that and and so um thank you very much you give <laughs> many points uh, <laughs> and, uh, to think about and you also said uh, this true lifestyle is destroyed or there is more on the way to be destroyed and and in a theological term, you mentioned the fall of man, and um, yeah, uh, what what would you say? Uh, how you would you describe that uh, and, and really explain why you think the true life uh, lifestyle is destroyed in our time? Yeah, so Christianity says we're a, a true our optimal species norm is that of the true life, and we could we can forget that. And we can also forget many other things that are connected to the true love norm. So let's just talk about that in this section. So we have this optimal three blessings norm. This is our place we, in psychology. We have this flow, which is like fruitful, being good at things, and we, and we have, which is, brings happiness and, and building social relationships, especially marriage and family, um, and doing something meaningful, life with the creation. You know, this is, these are three profound ways we find happiness. Now, other cultures have found that, have been able to establish this norm, this this norm, but it was, it was established on the uh, absolute sex, it, it, because you can't do those three things if the sexual norm is, isn't there, uh, of absolute sex. So all the great world cultures, the Greek, the Roman, the British, they grew because they mastered the art of lineage improvement, and lineage improvement could only happen if there was a reasonably strong marital norm. And they all just decayed in the same way. They decayed because of the rise in premarital sex, which led to a collapse in the marital norm, which led to more children being hurt, which led to lineage decline, which hurt the, the nation. And what, of course, citizens increasingly became excess, obsessed with my right to live out my sexual fantasies. And they failed to see how this brought about harm to children. So this is the process which which uh, all those great civilizations and our own uh, is, is, is collapsing. So how do you forget this lineage improvement? Because again, many Asians still understand it. They still have strong family bonds. They work together. Their children, when they come here, they, they do better than their parents often. That's what happened in our past because and they, they're just using our, the blessings of our culture. To get there but you use the absolute sex marital norm to, to get those blessings 
So when the absence of wedlock sex became increasingly in the West became the norm, people increasingly forgot to look at the ripple effects, the multiplication effects, the, the damage that outer lock wedlock sex did to children. That they and we 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 did that because we told ourselves some believable lies. We kind of like said, well, we have condoms, people can use condoms, or people can use the pill, and we will be okay. And obviously we're not, or they can have abortions and, and other that. But th there's other ripple effects, which are, because it's not centered upon God will, there are other ripple effects which happen. And they're negative because it's not centered upon our optimal species norm. And then so we still, we, because we, we, we have sex without thinking about the consequences to children, then we do, we also start to pass other laws eventually, which hurt children but we don't see it hurts children we think about the adults not about the children and so we get into this thinking pattern that adults have can do whatever they want and 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 we don't look at what happens to children and we tell ourselves even more lies uh, in that process like um like for example we have no fault divorce we tell ourselves a lie oh if, if parents are struggling it's better if they get a divorce well in in 20 percent of the cases that might be true that's probably true but in 80% of the cases, it's not true. The children have worse outcomes. and But we, we pass the law anyway, even though it leads to many more children having a, a problematic life and losing ability to build their own three blessings lifestyle. And so culture goes into this spiral downwards. And uh, we pass other laws, but we'll talk about that another time. Yeah. Um, when we enter into the worldview that we can have sex with anyone without any intention that that person is going to raise the child if there is one we we enter a different species norm this is the norm of the single parent species this is the norm of the cheetahs and the bears and they 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 meet the male there's some sexual interaction and then the mother goes off and raises the child by herself and there's no affectation of anything else there and that kind of when you enter into this world of hot sex, um, then people start to act like that, like the single parent species. However, unlike the single mother species in the wild, where the woman takes responsibility for, for, for the child, um, the Western woman no longer even has to do that. So she can have abortion or she can get welfare or she can get the child adopted or even when she's married, she can commit infidelity and, and destroy the marriage and she'll still get some demands that the husband pays and the, uh, or society will pay. And so it's uh, because puffinism is built upon people acting with nobility, all these laws just make people, more and more women act with less nobility and uh, they don't take responsibility being a sovereign citizen. And, and we lose the concept of being a sovereign citizen who is responsible for the well-being of their nation. And that's that's the end of democracy. That's the way democracy does. OK, so the multiplication effects are, are very wide of entering into a different species norm that, that we're not designed for. And one of them is the fact that the single parent species and the true love species have different dating patterns. They don't date in the same way so the true loves um, are looking at each other they're not competing with other males um, they, they they look at each other they they check each other out how they're out they often do a, a dance a mating dance uh, to see if they can harmonize and there's there's some feeling of togetherness um, if they don't feel it they will look for another partner in some other species and how that works out is 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 you know they're looking at each other as lifelong partners and the skills and and abilities to be that partner in raising the child but in the single parent species it's not like that at all that the woman is looking for alpha male typically she wants a, she wants a guy who's got big muscles she wants a guy who can sing well or um or can fight well and beat up the other males or who can um, build a build a nice house some of the species of birds have that and and she's looking for other qualities than a lifelong partner. And when she sees it, she says, that's the guy I want. And so when we enter into that world, more and more males start to do these things and they don't develop the partnering skills. They, they, they forget to do the things that are needed to become a good lifelong partner. And so if even they do meet up, it, it proves harder to, to connect and build something together. 
and it becomes much more temporary and we get into the world of um of cohabitation which is temporary and these are so very fragile and even in this so it's this dual culture we now have a dual character of uh, of the where a good young man who's not alpha but he's got good qualities to make a good partner um he just doesn't look attractive to to the women who are single parent species minded he's boring he's used to studies hard he, he doesn't uh, dance well he doesn't <laughs> have a chat up line he doesn't do all those things and uh, and he doesn't look attractive at all though he's a good partner and uh, and the qualities of the modest girl who make a maybe a really good wife and a partner there don't look attractive because she doesn't have, wear a hot swimsuit she doesn't do her trainings every day and you know, and 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 so everybody gets confused more and more people get confused about what makes a good lifelong partner and people develop skills that have nothing to do with lifelong partnering and and they don't develop the things that are and more and more problems happen because of that so we have these two different species norm in our culture so we get this so suddenly of course we get this tinder tinder app the the, the handsome alpha males are chased by by 90% of the females and the other 90% of males don't really have a look in uh, there's not enough of them there are not enough alpha males um, so what I've met a considerable number of women in their 30s who are still looking for that alpha top male. He's out there somewhere for me. But there aren't enough of them, honestly. And But she's not willing to take second best. And in the past, she would have had the second best and she would have helped him grow and learn and develop. And she, many women would prefer now prefer loneliness or even single mothering um, to, to finding not finding Mr. Not quite good enough. And so the brain cells get all all mixed up in the young people and it gets really confusing. And then you get confusion because there's two different sexual norms, but a lot of people are still the puffin brain children who are looking for it, but they're in a culture which is acting like a single parent species. It's like bringing a puffin into a into a cheetah's world and saying this 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 doesn't work for me. So many girls today, they look at the highly sexualized school culture, maybe in some schools, and they say, I don't, I'm, I'm not, uh, do I really have to give out? Do I really have to have sex so I can have a boyfriend? I don't want to. I don't come a puffin brain girl, and I just want to find a nice young man who doesn't want to do that. So all this is problematic, and so they give up trying, and they, they just go off and they get a job and they keep quiet, and they give up thinking about getting a boyfriend. Uh, uh, or we end up with these other girls who more and more growing up, these gender confused girls who um who are confused because they 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 think, well if I'm not I'm not a hot girl, I'm not a girl running after the boys, then and I don't not like that. Maybe I'm not a girl, and then they type in a few words in on the internet, what happens if I'm I feel like this? Uh, and they will be told, be given a quiz and they'll be told that they're a boy and then they get it lose their breasts or whatever and, and, and destroy their sex they become sterile. And it's it's a tragedy and they wake up at twenty three and they suddenly realise, oh there are different kinds of girls and some are hot girls and some are not. But in a highly sexualized dating culture where hormones are flowing in schools, they kinda like don't see that so easily. And so we get this gender confusion, which is a tragedy for our society. And then many boys today also, uh, they don't want to become the alpha male. They just want to be a reasonable human being. But but they, they get confused too. And, and uh, they just instead they do, I'm not even going to play this game because I'm, I'm not going on the dating app because nobody wants to swipe swipe me left and or right. And and, um, and they just go and play computer games instead. And so, you know, we see less and less actually... Well, in a hypersexualized culture, we, we're seeing more and more people not having partners, sex. You know, they just they just uh, say, "I don't want to play this game anymore. This is not the game that brings me happiness." So we see in the past, when in the, from about the 1900s, when the uh, well, more and more families uh, got the skills to build their own families and had the money to do so, um, the norm of absolute monogamy. Um, was, was strong and uh, about 90% of the middle class were married and about 80% of the working class were married. Uh, there was limited premarital sex and the society had a common vision of what sexuality was about, where it belonged within marriage, because that's protected society. But with this hypersexualization, now only about 40% of the working 
class marry and about 80 percent of the so the upper are still doing quite well but the lower are really struggling and what happens to them they're, well they stay single they're lonely they're, many are depressed they, they want a boy but they can't find one they 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 go out and they, the boy thinks he has to push her for sex even so she doesn't want it and it just becomes messy um and um and they stay lonely and they just go to work and they but they just get enough to pay the rent most of them um and that money goes to the wealthy families and so you get this system like a wolf wolf pack system returning where fewer and fewer people can manage their lives at the bottom they don't marry and their their, their income goes up to the to the upper classes and to the to the outer walls and that's what where we're going but this is of course a tragedy for the more for lonely people and the all the other problems um so the culture war we're experiencing is directly linked to this to this breakdown of sexual sexual norms. It's it's, it's completely about this. Um, the inner is the growing inability of people to control their sexual pattern passion. So wherever you look in the sex culture war, wherever you look, you'll find this at the bottom. So there's a lot of tension in America, especially with the African American racism and held back by white domination or racism or things like this. But actually, the the struggle, the the Asians are doing very well in in America. The Indians are doing very well, and and they're doing that because because the family system is strong. And the reason why the African Americans are struggling is because their families have been destroyed by the by the far left. The family system has been attacked by wealth with welfare packages which destroy marriages and things like that. But then they blame they, they blame the whites when actually the, the people who are blaming uh, the whites are the people who did the pro created the problem in the first place. And then you also have this growth in gender confused kids um, who identify with the LGBT lifestyle is also connected. So, so you end up with this culture war between people who understand something about this, like it may be a Catholics or uh, various churches or religions, Muslims and, and, and Hindus understanding a lot of these things, and they they have to do battle with this of this now dominant narrative, um, and uh, it, the culture war starts, and um, and we're people who understand that children need protecting and loving and taking care of are seen as nasty people for being intolerant of adults when all they're doing is not they're not being trying to be intolerant of adults they're just saying adults shouldn't be allowed to hurt children and in this way and you can't pass laws which allow adults to hurt children because that doesn't help us at all it's just about the legal process um, that people are upset about that allow adults to hurt children like abortion yeah um and uh it's 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 the media spins it you're a far right wing or you're um intolerant of other people per se adults but your your primary concern is no you should, laws it's the laws that allow adults to hurt children that need that are wrong and uh it's not it's uh, all laws it doesn't matter what it is it just shouldn't shouldn't be there so what if we summarize out of what wedlock sex you can call it owls which is kind of cute thing but it's a very sad thing you know it's not part of our optimal species norm it's not how we're designed it's not it's not part of you say god's design for human beings we don't do at all well as a culture when this happens we just start to crumble we have no common vision our children get hurt so and it's degenerative so we children get hurt we forget the process of lineage improvement, which is what we're doing today. Um, we destroy the bonding process, so more people get lonely, uh, more, more people incapable uh, building a lasting relationship. Um, it's the almost every social problem we know of is connected to it. Uh, our national debt is, is deeply linked to it, and uh, we just get an identity crisis amongst puffin brain children. Who, who aren't being taught at all to be puffing children. It's, it's just, just ludicrous that our children are treated this way and, and our schools are doing this to them. They're meant to be educational places who, which give children the skills to live a successful three blessings lifestyle. And they're, right now they're doing, they're doing something tragic, absolutely tragic for our people. Yeah. Now, it, it's okay it, it, when you can say, well, you know, this is only happening in the West, but actually the sexual revolution, the movies, the culture is going worldwide. 
um, all these religions that once understood this are crumbling uh, everywhere. The, the um, No religion, cultural tradition that asks for a restriction on sexuality seems to be able to survive this, this cultural onslaught. Um, top social commentators, most of them don't understand the root of the problem. They talk about Marxism or all kinds of other things, which is part of it for sure. But um, the root of the problem is the breakdown in sexual norms, and people, very few people talk about that. And if it's not so, then the, the, the future of humanity will look basically like uh, economically struggling nations with many, many lonely people, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot of loneliness, a lot of hurt children, uh, and will be ruled by oligarchs, yeah? um, and uh, who are just who control the media and, and tell, tell anybody along, who comes along and says we should strengthen marriage as a means to solve this problem, they will be told they're far right wing and they will be locked up or shut up, which is what we're starting to see in, in, in various forms now. And uh, still, you know, some nations are trying to fight. Africa nations are telling America to stop telling them to enter into this family destructive laws. Um, East Europe is telling West Europe not to invade their space. They're trying to build, trying to learn how to build good families and let them do that. Um, but um, it's very hard. The, 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 the people behind this are, are out to destroy the other nations and make a lot of money doing so. So. Um, it's 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 our future, and it, it, the only way you can solve it fundamentally um, is to understand what the framework is, and to personally live it out. You know, personally choose to live it out, and to encourage other people to live it out, because it, it's it's a free choice, it's a free will issue, and people have to just understand what it is that. Um, so you have to link up with some maybe some church that teaches this kind of um, norm help your children understand the value of this norm and uh and it's the because the culture will will not <laughs> will definitely not help your children at all in today's world um have a successful life by restricting their sexuality by um uh, teaching them that uh, the good things uh, uh that they need to do uh, honesty and uh, keep away from drugs and alcohol and all these other things which are so we have a major problem uh, on our hands and we we have to solve this um, because otherwise we uh, the future for our beautiful grandchildren is going to be extremely bleak we already sense that in England you know massive increases in prices more and more people not being able to afford homes uh, more and more people dying of cold in winter the loneliness the overwhelmed uh, health service the uh, schools are breaking down there is just people want to teach because the children are becoming dysfunctional um and the police are, are um are arresting people who 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 say marriage is important something very painful to watch if you understand what's happening you can't have puffinism and this is a matter of sexuality. Yeah, this is a, a way of explaining, uh, not very theologically, but very realistically, the consequences of losing sexual norms. And it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, girls uh, feeling that they might be a boy because of not realizing what is a girl but or or the way how they feel they want to be a girl a girl like a puffing girl the society doesn't allow it or yeah. community is pushing in different way uh what do you think is this would be the same with boys that they don't know what this means to be a boy and then they rather want to be a girl could be this also well, a lot of a lot of the boys that try are um who transition um, historically, I mean, there's far, it used to be far more boys than girls. Now it's far more girls than boys. Um, but boys in general, in the, historically, they they tend to be the boys who um, have experienced um, uh, same-sex attraction. And there are certain ki different kinds of males who experience them. Some are more masculine and some are more feminine. And the ones who are more feminine in nature tend to historically be feel that this is the way to go forward, you know. To, to have the bottom surgery and things like this. Um, but the suicide rates are very high among people who do this, even if they desperately want to do it. it it's, a, it's, a, it's a 
it's complicated. It, the drugs are very horrible, often for the body. The, they often need constant surgeries. They, they many times they have they find it hard to keep a job because of the health needs and and, and other issues. And and they're often very lonely because very few people want to, you know, marry a person like that. So, mm. it, 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 if you kill off all the ways that we we find meaning, then 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 often they, they you know, what's the point of it all? It's not a so it's not a happy future it's not a fruitful lifestyle mm. but if you look in the data from the 1960s and 70s and 80s before they stopped creating data especially in the age period uh, a lot of males became got into the same sex attraction lifestyle because they were raped as children or sexually molested by a male about 40 percent i've seen like six studies all about 40 percent of these same homosexuals have been uh, molested and that had dragged them into this lifestyle. It wasn't what they had been born with. It was just molestation and and, and ensuing um, need to be loved. And there's also Denmark study, massive study, which showed that okay, having a father absent, you know, not was certain personality boys found that really hard to know how to grow up to be a man. And they were far more affected by their mother um, personality. So all this data is now quashed and, and it's not born this way absolutely in the data. It's 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 formed this way because of the um, dysfunctionality of of how I say human human lifestyles. And um, as we as we become more dysfunctional, as a family collapses more and more, then this 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 just grows. That's that's what we've seen. Yeah. So what was a rare experience back in the sixties is now much more commonplace. And they say, no, they're coming out. No, no, no. It's we're having <laughs> more and more dysfunctional families and more and more sexual abuse because of that. And more and more girls who are abused who say, I never want to know another man again because they're abusive. I just can't, I'll go with a girl. Mm -hmm. And we're having all kinds of issues. So this is a tragedy. Once you lose this puffin ways, the children, the puffin children, brain children, just they're psychologically, so many of them. Uh, have different forms of trauma and societies all all the societies that, that the, the civilizations that started decay had this gender confusion and gender issues uh, because when children don't have that model of god in, in their parents and the love of god through their parents then 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 we get deeply affected by that yeah so it's a it's a it's a serious problem a lot of people say, well, the end result is basically the legalization of paedophilia and um, basically Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, and uh, nobody can say anything because there's no standard left. <laughs> it's a it's like it's like a drug. It's like taking drug. Once you take that first dose of heroin, pretty soon it's not enough. And you've got to take more and then you've got to take more again. And then you get another drug. Maybe it's like pornography. You, you know, watch standard pornography but after some time you get bored with it so you want threesomes and then you want child sexual abuse and it's exactly the same when you it's never a once you break that sex can happen out of marriage like it just goes expands mm -hmm. now i want threesomes now we want open marriage now we want this we want that and it mm -hmm. and it just gets crazier and crazier and there's no end to that craziness no end mm -hmm. And the only way to stop it is to put it back into its box mm. and expect everybody to mm. behave themselves. But it, yeah. uh, it, Stephen, do you have any data on, for example, uh, pornography is uh, many times uh, combined with violence in sexual uh, relationships? And I, I, I don't how know does enough it of... affect the family? Because many say the most uh, violent uh, things happen in the family. No? One of the biggest problems is, of course, is that girls now in schools um, are expected to, on their first sexual encounter, to behave like a prostitute. And many, of course, many girls, puffing girls, absolutely don't. So it just makes it even hyper. You know, it's not just I want sex with you. It's I want sex with something tied around your throat or some extreme form. Because the other normal sex doesn't excite anymore. And then the big problem we have in a lot of 
marriages fit with pornography is um is that men can know and women and women actually can't get turned on unless they're watching pornography and have sex at the same time because of this this incremental effect of nothing stimulates me anymore what is it should be a beautiful act of tenderness and joy and happiness and give and take and giving each other what you want and and, and, and it becomes like the only thing that will turn me on is this this extreme stuff mm. yeah and, hollywood is full of people who uh like you explained before that uh, women's only want the alpha men's and vice versa and want the uh, ladies who who are somehow seen in the magazines uh can see then how long it lasts and how they completely experience disaster so um yeah yeah i mean the data on the data on this is very clear it's been long-term studies and those who refrain from out of so wedlock sex who wait until sex until marriage build the strongest families that's it mm. it's pretty evident and the mentality because the mentality you have you you when you you're not having sex before marriage you're really looking at each other qualities and you're asking to each other to develop other qualities mm. yeah you're not you're saying if you want me you have to develop yourself i'd like you to develop yourself i want to see if you can date me i want to see if you can we can do partnership together i want to see if you can be responsible etc 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 and if the male isn't she'll kind of like send signals and he'll start to change his ways mm. and so in that dating process of two or three years maybe he he becomes he says okay if i'm going to get this girl which i like um uh, and i want to have a family with then i have to change and she has power mm. and the The woman who doesn't give herself away has power to change, help the man mature mm. before. And that's extremely important process as the man is separating from his parents. He, he needs some things maturing a bit before he bonds. Um, but if they enter into sex, it's like he's, it's like there's no there's no there's not much power left uh, in that gap. Once they marry, there's some power back. The woman can say you promised yourself so i can demand things from you mm. but in that cohabitation or that there's not a lot of power and and women find it really hard to to because he says well if you get too pushy with me i can walk out there are lots of other cats out there female cats who who want a male yeah. and so the power of a woman comes from her ability to control her own sexual nature and therefore help influence the male to mature before mm. they marry and women who do that have the best best mm. marriages the lasting marriages and the least infidelity well, how, how would you value the um parents or if they lucky uh, they're lucky to have father and mother uh how, how would you estimate the, the importance of like uh, getting advice from the parents because many times young people are unsure if this is one or the, uh, what what do you think about that Well, of course, <laughs> what, do you, what do you want as a parent? You want your children to be happy, uh, ideally happily married so you don't have to look after the children. You don't have to be too, you have to see them being functional, looking after their families, loving each other, mm. doing economically well. What do you want? Most of us want that. That's what we want. So if you're going to let, if you're going to give advice to your children, teach them about the problems of people. You have to learn about it. You have to go and study about Uh, you have to find out and figure it out yourself and learn that that it who gets the the best most likely to get the three through blessings lifestyle which you would like your children to have and and if that means you join a church community then then to to try to get that support because that most church communities still teach puffinism i mean i i stopped drinking because because i lived in a culture which was high, highly alcoholic and i wanted to teach my children that they're That, that, that they control they can control this and they don't have to go the way of the culture um i want my children to to live a fruitful and and multiplication and mm. <laughs> yeah, life that's... and that will make me happiness that's just as it, it makes i think god happy and the, the one thing that the principle you know that we talked about this you know how the principle explains the christian welfare it one thing it made clear was that god in the bible um feels happy or sad depending on how we act 
In other words, when we don't multiply goodness, when we don't build lifestyles which are full of goodness, God can be extremely sad that he made us as human beings. Mm. And he, he, you know, he's made this beautiful, incredible planet for us. And we, we you know, he's just asking us to do a bit of self-control. <laughs> the rest of it is free. The rest of it is out there. It's the rainbows, the sunset, mm. the fruits, the taste, the, mm. the joy, the laughter, everything else. But just I'm asking you, please, just just control that and you will be able to enjoy it and your grandchildren can enjoy it. And we seem to just, no, it's not enough for us. We we want that. We want to eat that 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 one too, please. Even if it destroys our families and lives, and and we just we don't need to. We just our ancestors didn't go that way, and we have the power to not go that way. Yeah, it seems uh, that uh, your advice will, uh, will be heard and um, practiced uh, because yeah this is important to to think about it and reflect upon it and as a parents or as young people of the young parents how they can guide their own children uh, because the time goes so quickly and then they suddenly are in an age where they are uh, yeah trying to find a partner and um, if then the parents want to give advice, maybe it's a bit late. They have to start early, early. to mm. really communicate. I mean, and I think I think teaching their children puffinism, I think it's a really simple way to teach children mm. and to explain to children, you know, this is the rules for human. This works best for us. Mm. Even though you're growing up in a society which many of people have forgotten, um, your grandpa, your grandma and grandma did that probably, and that's why they are still together maybe. Um, and if you can start this story young, yeah, mm -hmm. you can choose books specifically that yeah. uh, focus on these issues, um, especially personal development, honesty, and things like mm -hmm. this. Anything that will help a person live a puppy lifestyle is is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean that's the tragedy of the school books entering the library system today. Yeah, they're just saying you, you can do whatever you want with this mm -hmm. stuff, and you will be equally happy. No, no, mm -hmm. no. Okay. That's not how it works. That's not how human beings work. Mm -hmm. And you just have to look at the data on problems associated with. You know, the increase of rates of, of abuse, rape, whatever it is, or whenever you leave this puffin lifestyle. And it's not really uh, what you want for your children. Mm. And um, I just uh, could only hope you encourage them to, to understand what their original nature is uh, and how we're designed mm. for, for best mm. yeah. outcomes. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh... You described the Christian worldview very well, and um, they also you touched the woke uh, postmodern worldview. Well, no, we haven't got into that. No, uh, once you understand, once you are, yeah, right. So the second half of the interview, yeah, we're going to um, follow on, but it's going to we're going to look at how now we understand the framework of how human beings exist with love and beauty and three blessings and the inner workings and the social purposes and and yes. lineage improvement and things like that, then we can see how this modern worldview is taking this apart and dismantling it piece by piece, making it ever harder for mm. us to build a flourishing society. Mm. And so it's really interesting to know how, well, so that's what we're going on to next. Um, how is this being done? Mm -hmm. You know, what is really happening? Mm. Why are we having a cultural war? Because, well, because because there are some people who have completely, you know, forgotten this. Yeah. 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 Um, and how this is being done and the consequences of it. Mm. So this is the next part of the interview. Well, once again, I want to thank you very much for your time and effort. And so we can uh, conclude now, I think.